Hey guys, it's Ross Gull, and on the Space Couch today, I'd like to talk to you about Elon Musk and Robert Bigelow and how they're natural allies in the development of the new space industry. Right, so Elon Musk, he builds rockets and capsules. Bigelow builds habitats. Bigelow needs Elon's rockets and capsules to service his habitats and indeed launch them. Although there's other providers out there, obviously Boeing and Sierra Nevada. And Elon's going to need destinations other than the International Space Station to send his capsules to. The BA-330 and the Olympus habitats would come to mind. This will lead to infrastructure growth, um, both in orbit, um, probably at the Moon, uh, at Mars, and probably waste stations and staging posts on the way there. Now, as you recall, the original Genesis 1 and 2 were proof of concepts launched um, on a Russian, I think, Dnieper rocket, as there was no US launch uh, provider available uh, at a cost that was affordable. Elon Musk had offered to um, launch it on his proposed Falcon 5 rocket, but timetables didn't work out, and in the end, um, Bigelow went with the Russians. Falcon 5 was cancelled and replaced by the Falcon 9. And as it happens, it's a Falcon 9 that's going to be launching the beam as part of the CRS-8 resupply mission in September. So, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, as we all know. Now, he said that uh, his Mars Colonial Transport, which is this giant ship that he's planning on building, will be, as he calls it, a completely new architecture, you know? i.e. it's not going to look like other spaceships. Kind of like the Tesla Model 3 apparently isn't going to look like other cars. He stated that this um, MCT would be able to carry 100 passengers or 100 tonnes of cargo uh, when it's fully loaded. But the first flights would be uh, weighted more towards cargo rather than passengers. Uh, maybe a dozen people to start help um, kick off the colonisation process, set up the initial infrastructure. Possibly um, first attempts at terraforming, who knows. For the amount of passengers and cargo he's going to need to carry to Mars, and one day no doubt pass there, I can't see any options other than these Bigelow habitats. The amount of space that you get versus, say, traditional modules like what are on the, um, the ISS or what made up the Mir. And he's going to need that expansion room on his MCT um, if he's going to get everything he wants there. And also, probably, to form the initial habitats of the Mars colony. Uh, detach it from the, um, from the, I guess, the backbone of the spaceship. Fly it through the atmosphere and land it. I mean, that's kind of what uh, Bigelow's planning to do on the moon. Um, but this is why the launch of the beam is very important. If it works as planned, then we'll probably... Uh, expect to see these habitats as part of the Mars Colonial Transport, as well as the standalone uh, stations or grouped-up bases. Uh, I mean, like, say, how long till we see a Facebook station in orbit, or a Googleplex, Apple station, something like that? I mean, they're the guys who actually have the money to fund and build all these things, after all. But I guess, eventually, we'll probably end up with an orbital White House. I mean, by then, within 100 years, you're not going to be able to run a space-based civilization at the bottom of a gravity well, are you? So, as I said, Bigelow needs uh, SpaceX's rockets and um, ships to service these habitats and probably his lunar base in due course. Um, and remember, SpaceX are teaming up with Google and Fidelity to fund that constellation of low-cost satellites for cheap internet access. Ostensibly, that is to help pay for the Mars Colonial Transport and the colonisation costs, but this is, more importantly, another proof of concept, because in the 21st century, you can't go to Mars or anywhere off-world and not have internet access. I mean, our civilization is utterly dependent on its technology, you know, particularly the internet and Wi-Fi and all the things that go with it. And they're going to be crucial for off-world colonies. So these internet satellites for Earth, um, 
<clears throat> That's a proof of concept for a future Mars-based constellation, I expect. You're going to need global 24-hour GPS, comms and internet access on Mars once we get there. Otherwise, we might as well step onto the surface of Mars and step back 50 years, if not more, while doing so. I mean, we'd probably... Uh, imagine it'd be like the days of the original lunar landings and how low-tech they were in comparison to now. We've got to be able to do better when we get there. So, this global internet um, satellite constellation, that would be very useful also to have one of those at the moon as Bigelow is probably thinking about. Although I don't know if you could probably bounce off the Earth-based one, I'm not sure. Not certain on satellite technology, so anyway. Because <laughs> um, Bigelow, once he's at the moon, what he's most afraid of, other than, like, say, claim jumpers, it's the Chinese. They've made no uh, bones about their intentions to go to the moon, and he's very afraid that they'll just claim it for themselves. Uh, obviously, out of space treaty, but it's easy enough to pull out of that. So he wants to get there first, and I'm sure Elon Musk has probably had similar thoughts about Mars and what would happen if the Chinese got there and how that would affect the future of his plans. I mean, who knows what kind of skullduggery would go on on a world or a moon where there isn't global comms. It's going to be like the Wild West out there for the first few decades anyway, you know? Especially, say, on the moon, on the far side of the moon. How are you going to get in touch with anyone? You need those global satellite fleets. So, obviously, Bigelow must be interested in that. So, Elon Musk, he wants to colonise Mars, but he wants to go there personally. So, he's got a great deal invested in assuring that these Bigelow habitats do work as advertised. And that is one of the main reasons why I think this lunar base that Bigelow wants to build is so important. This, again, it's another proof of concept for Mars. Great test lab for living off-world in a low-gravity environment, um, like the International Space Station has been for living in space. You want to know that those Bigelow habitats will protect you in space and on the surface of another world from radiation, storms, micrometeorites. And the moon's perfect for that before they start getting shipped out to Mars. So, SpaceX and Bigelow, they're definitely natural allies. Although, it's got a touch of Wayland yutani about it, don't you think? SpaceX Bigelow. Bigelow SpaceX. I don't know, I mean, even if that were to be the case and became some behemoth like that, they're still forging the future of the human race together, and for me that's very exciting and inspiring. I mentioned in a previous video at the press media availability for the Beam handover, the Bigelow factory in Las Vegas, that um, the Olympus served as a backdrop. Uh, it, it looked just a little bit different from the drawings I'd seen of it. Um, well, maybe that's as a result of input from people like, say, Elon Musk and SpaceX, who, as I've made clear, I reckon are going to be major customers of these habitats. I mean, the upcoming um, Falcon Heavy could probably launch the Olympus after all, and maybe they've tweaked its design based on the parameters of that. Yeah. It's funny because, I mean, you know how Elon Musk, he likes to rant sometimes about certain types of technology he's not in favour of, um, say, uh, space-based solar power, he's not in favour of that at all. Um, hydrogen fuel cells, or fuel cells, as he calls them. Well, I've never heard him diss the Bigelow technology. In fact, any time either of them refer to each other, it's always a bit cagey, you know? It's like, I saw a press conference that Elon Musk was at, um, talking about those capsules, and someone mentioned, where else could they go? And he kind of thought of a moment and said, um, you know Bigelow? Just kind of like that, you know, just like, oh yeah, this guy, he's building stuff, you know, as well. And whenever the same sort of question has been asked uh, to Robert Bigelow um, about cooperation with SpaceX, you know, uh, he's used it something like that, ask Elon Musk. <laughs> Elon Musk is not going to tell you. Um, but, you know, that old Terry Pratchett um, quote, there's a lot going on that we don't know about. I suspect that's probably the case here as well. There probably is a great deal of cooperation. Cooperation, as it's sometimes called in the new space industry, this crossover between cooperating and competing with each other. I think that's probably is the case here. Um, so... Elon Musk, he's never said that that tech isn't any good. And, like I said, space elevators, he also disses. So, 
he must believe in this expandable technology. I'm sure he must have gone over the, um, the plans for it, given that he's launching one of these things soon. It's likely to be the first of many collaborations with them. Remember that rolling half a million dollar deposit that's going to get used at some point. Yeah. And given that uh, Bigelow, you know, his brass ring is this lunar base, well, who's to say as that company grows, there might not be a Martian base. I'm sure um, they'd expand to that if it was a successful venture. Elon Musk's colonisation of Mars notwithstanding. I mean... They could end up Bigelow, that is, possibly SpaceX as well, and deep space industries, planetary resources, resources, with a bunch of bases and way stations scattered throughout the inner solar system and further out in due course. Elon Musk has said he thinks Enceladus and Ceres would be interesting places to visit. And obviously we've had some recent news on both those worlds. It is very exciting. And one day there will be humans on those worlds. Yeah, definitely. So, um, SpaceX and Bigelow, they're driving forward with their plans. Uh, where do you think we're going to be in 10 years? I mean, how many 330s and what would be the plural of Olympus? Olympi? Sounds, yeah, Olympi. How many of them could there be in orbit? How far along the construction of the Mars Colonial Transport are we going to be? I can't wait to see the plans for that. Like I said, that's going to be after the launch of the beam, I expect. If it's before, then I would have thought he's not using Bigelow and he's got his own tech, which also would be very interesting. Guess we'll find out. Um, by then, actually, in September, we ought to have had a successful um, landing of a Falcon 9, either on that drone ship or at the uh, launch, uh, arrival pad, it's called. A landing pad, I believe, that they've just purchased or leased from the uh, US Air Force, I think in Kennedy or Canaveral. So, very interesting times ahead. Particularly for these two characters, Bigelow and Musk. I mean, they've got so much in common. Uh, they really should be natural allies and best friends. Maybe they are, and they just can't say anything until it's got enough momentum that it can't be stopped. I certainly hope so. It'd be great to see as many of those big little habitats as possible. And not just one Mars Colonial Transport, but an entire fleet of them. There's going to have to be if he wants to transport millions of people. Anyway, guys, that was just my thoughts on Elon Musk and Robert Bigelow and what they're doing for all of us. As always, please subscribe to my channel if you enjoy this or like the video. And you're more than welcome to leave a comment or a suggestion for a future episode.